I don't deserve that warm welcome, but I certainly do thank you from the bottom of my heart. I do try. We all fall short of the mark, but we all are ministers to God in our own way. And of course, all of you who know me uh, know that I am serious about what I have to say. I try to do my homework, and I try to give you the facts, and I try to give you them in, in sufficient detail so that you will understand what is happening to us. In past messages that I have delivered at different camps and different conferences, and in our newsletter, I have described the unequivocal trend, and it's unequivocal. There's no argument about this trend. We've heard messages last night, we've heard messages this morning that alludes to this trend, and I tell you it is unequivocal that this trend within our government is to become more authoritarian and more dictatorial. It's just the way it is. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA as it is lovingly called, and its associated SWAT team concept, example, along with the national law, nationalization of all of the law enforcement in the United States, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. We have described this in detail in some of my, our newsletters and some of our past messages. And so <clears throat> one needs only but to recall the words that I have given you in past messages to understand what I'm talking about there. But what has been done has been, has been shown that Hegelian dialectics has been used repeatedly to create a need for a more militant government. Now, I've spoken on Hegelian dialectics, and of course I, I've explained to you that it came from the name of, it came from a man by the name of George Wilhelm Hegel, who was uh, a very brilliant man, a very brilliant professor in Germany in the, in the 1830s and 1840s, contemporary with Karl Marx. That doesn't mean that they were together, but I mean he was at the same time with Karl Marx. And he showed that uh, nature, just life, history, has shown that there has always been a contest between two opposing forces. And of course the first opposing force, what he called the thesis, and then the opposing force to that, he called the antithesis, and then of course the thesis and the antithesis would fight and out would drop a synthesis or a result. And that in return, in turn, would then become uh, the thesis for a new argument and a antithesis would would be uh, developed and of course then again a result in synthesis known down the line. And of course <coughs> uh, I have shown that examples were given in these dialectics, it was called the Hegelian dialectics, and I've shown where these examples were given in the dialectics where the national problems were actually created intentionally. Now that seems very difficult for us to understand in our Christian Republic that there were problems created intentionally in order to create a national emergency. But as we will continue here, I believe I'll prove to you that this has been the case. Then after this problem, this, this need came about, it was always justified then to develop the authoritarian and the militant organization at the federal level to counter what they had termed this extraordinary threat to our society. Now they, they developed the threat, this extraordinary threat, and we'll go into this. The controlled news media, working for them, has always cranked out the established line of propaganda in a most convincing manner. Now to be sure, they've taken little exceptions, editorializing if you were. Well, now maybe it wasn't exactly this way, or some editorial will come along. A so-called conservative will, will show that the mainline media uh, has, uh, is really in error in saying what they say and so forth. But th this, 
so-called kosher conservative really isn't a conservative. Uh, he just is allowed to mouth these words, but the controlled news media continues on uh, in, in parroting, in cranking out the propaganda for this need for mil more authoritarian, more militant government. And of course, the average American, he loves his country, and he believes in his country, he believes in his people, and he just doesn't, can't possibly believe that there is something so terrible that I'm going to describe this morning could possibly happen in the United States of America. And he buys this propaganda hook, line, and sinker. All right, the examples, I just have a few here, and I brought them back in time far enough to bridge back to the days of the, uh, the John Birch Society, major days and major efforts there and so forth, so that you can go back in history to show that this has been some time in the making. And this is, and what I'm going to give you is only in recent history. It has gone back much further back than that. The examples of these created national problems that all of us should uh, easily remember are the Watts riots in California. Have the conditions changed in Watts any to cause any more riots? No. But there were riots in Watts, California. Why were there riots in Watts, California? The Kent State riots, then with the attendant National Guard confrontation that took place at Kent State University. Why was there a riot at Kent State University? Has the conditions changed? Have the conditions changed uh, from that time to this to say, well, we shouldn't have any more Kent State confrontations? Of course not. The conditions are the same. There has been no correction of the conditions. They've even been worsened. But then there were things happened at Kent State that was a part of the dialectics. Each of these national incidents were proven to be instigated by well-funded and well-organized organi personages, groups. There is no question about this. The proof abounds on this. All right, now, what in all of this has been the response of the government. What has the government done? They didn't uh, go after the perpetrators. Did they go after the perpetrators for the Chicago, se uh, the Chicago 7 at the 1968 Democrat, uh, Democratic Convention? No, they didn't go after those perpetrators. In fact, most, in most of the cases, the perpetrators have been elevated to national prominence. And they've even been eulogized within the government and the news media. What happened to Abby Hoffman of the Chicago 7? What happened to Tom Hayden, assemblyman from California? What happened to Jerry Rubin of the Chicago 7? All have become famous. It was Jerry Rubin, according to many independent investigators, who fired the first shot at the Kent State ma uh, massacre and, uh, and the shooting in, at Kent State University. All right, now, it was, wasn't it Tom Hayden's ex-wife, Hanoi Jane Hot Fonda, that was here recently honored at a dinner with Gorbachev in Bush's, in Bush's uh, uh, White House? Was not this the case? All right, so now, what have they done to the perpetrators? They've elevated them into positions of national prominence. We're at the point now where they are our leaders. They're at the point now where we are to follow the directions from them as compared to our God and to our Christian Republic. Why wasn't there an immediate response to the Muriel boat lift, the Muriel boat invasion of Cubans, the Cuban misfits? There wasn't any immediate response. They let them come on board. They made noises in an editorialized version in the newspapers, etc., but they made no response to it. They allowed them to come here openly and freely and go where they would. What about the Vietnamese boat lift? Forty percent of the Vietnamese boat lift people were Viet Cong people. And many of the rest of them were drug smugglers and part of the Vietnamese Mafia. And our churches bleated out taking care of these people, even bringing them into your home and adopting them, etc. Where has our country been, our government been, 
with this massive illegal invasion from the South. Where are they? What has happened to it? It's all a part of the Hegelian dialectics. And these people, many of these people from the South, understand many of them are just poor people trying to get out of trouble, trying to save their family. But that doesn't mean that we should allow our own families to be sunk into the mire, to be de totally destroyed as a nation in order to help a few others. And that's what we've done. No, our government knew exactly what they were doing when they did nothing. In fact, they pounced immediately and very, very forcefully on any individual and any group that tried to stop the illegal in invasion from the South. You all know the histories of these things. So the dialectics of creating a dramatic need for more authoritarian government was very well established and very well put into uh, the minds of the public of America. This is nothing but the controlled thesis of the Hegelian dialectics. It was the dialectics or the, uh, the, the antithesis of the dialectics that the government developed to counter the dialectics that the, the thesis that the government itself created. So here now, the government created a problem and now they're going to come forth on a great white horse and solve the problem. The first thing that they did following the Watts riots, the Chicago 7, the Kent State, was to develop a sufficient national police force that would be there and would be, have enough strength to counter any potential small-scale uprisings or protests by the God-fearing, ordinary American citizen. That was the purpose of it. It wasn't for the purpose of stopping Jerry Rubin and Ab Abby Hoffman, was it, or Tom Hayden, was it? It was for another purpose, and I just stated it to you. It was obvious to these men, now in high places within our government, that they are in the final stages of destroying our American Christian way of life, that they knew there would eventually be rebellion in the United States of America. There would be rebellion within those God-fearing, God-loving, Christian Americans that up to now have done nothing. They knew this, and they knew that there would be many Americans who would awaken to the terrible realization that their beloved country has been stolen from them. It's been stolen, brothers and sisters. It's gone. A group of us ministers and elders have for many years gone to Washington. We've gone there. We visit the congressional offices periodically from year to year, to year for the purpose of exchanging information with them. We have always presented them to them the Christian way of life of doing governmental business. And in return, they have always told us what the good job that they were doing was. And we would have to patiently listen to the good job that they were doing. And they really were awful busy uh, to listen very intently as to what we had to say about the way they should be running their job. But you see, a lot of people thought, well, we're wasting money going. No, we learned more than we taught. We knew this every time we went. We indeed did learn more than we taught. Now we learned that there was a battle going on right there in Washington within the congressional offices over the control of the minds of men. We knew this and we figured out how it was done. That is what God gave us in return for you people sending us to Washington to try to talk some common sense into the con congressman. We learned that there was a battery of trained legislative aides and assistants who worked in these offices on a perpetual basis. 
They were there year in and year out. When a congressman or a senator retired or was voted out, these congressional aides, these legislative aides and assistants, would return to a pool from, where, from which they would be hired again by the new senator or congressman or in that particular district or even then into another district in another state. But it was still from that pool. Now these people, these legislative aides, these congressional assistants, they're smart, they're educated, they're intelligent, and they're trained in the manners of Washington, D.C. They know how to move legislation. Now, it is these men and these women who write the proposed legislation. They also review the legislation that was written by their colleagues in other senators and other congressmen's offices. So it's all in the pool. It's all in the team from that trained pool of assistants that are perpetuated in Washington. We learned this, and we watched them. We talked to them, and we could see that they're motivated by something indifferent, uh, entirely differently than we are. It is these people who actually run the Congress. In Matthew 13, and verses 24 and 25, we read this. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now just suppose, just suppose for the moment that some of these aides, and I'll even say some of them because I know that there are some fine Christian people there, albeit ignorant, albeit Judeo-Christians, albeit thinking that those who they, whom they are working with are really good people. There's some good people there because we met them. But nevertheless, just suppose that most or some of these aides and assistants have allegiance to another system or another master. Could that possibly have happened? It has happened. They're there. They run America. But while men slept, trained aides and assistants wrote legislation that was diametrically opposed to the American Christian principles of requiring that a crime must have a victim and that a person is in control of his own actions unless he hurts someone else. And then he personally is responsible for those actions. They took all of that away. Those are God's laws we're talking about. That's God's way of doing it. But they took all of those away, uh, all those away, and they made a Talmudic regulatory ordinance type government. You cannot have a victimless crime in God's book. You cannot regulate righteousness in God's book. But these people have. But they also know the dialectics. They also can manipulate the government into the position they want it into. Laws were written to protect the actions that were to become the thesis of the Hegelian dialectics. When these actions became a national problem to our society, our people clamored for another law. The news media, the newspapers, the the uh, television was just full of it, just like the perpetrators knew would happen. They knew we would ask for it. They knew we would clamor for another law. They knew that we would love to have it so. So they worked toward that end. And in every case, the counter laws always required more police powers. Police powers of 20 years ago are a magnitude different than they are today. Did you know that a large share of U.S. forest rangers are a part of the National Police Force? Did you know that? They carry a weapon, they carry a badge, they carry a card. They go to school to learn to be a federal police officer. 
The same situation exists in the National Park Service. The same situation exists in other federal agencies that are out among the public, out in the field. They're all a part of the National Police Force. In this, in the, uh, at the state level, the game department wardens have all been deputized. They're a part of that system. The State Park Service employees are a part of that system. And there are others. They're all a part of what has become the National Police Force. They train together and they work together. With my own eyes, I have seen city police, state police, and federal police all working together for one common cause. They exchange equipment back and forth. They exchange expertise back and forth to do one job. All right, now, that unified police force that they created was done to counter a situation that the government itself created. According to the Washington Report, say News Weekly, the Pentagon is planning to build what they have called a combat village up in Gilderland, New York. And the purpose that they state was to train soldiers to be able to fight in urban warfare. However, according to inside sources, the real purpose is they're building a facility to train soldiers for counterinsurrection in mass domestic uprisings. I have here in my hand House Bill H.R. 4079. It's 96 pages long. 96 pages. It's a real masterpiece, and it's martial law. In this bill, we have the another antithesis to the Hegelian dialectics to counter the thesis, the problem that they themselves created. So that's the name of the Hegelian dialectics. Here's the antithesis. The Vietnamese boat people, the Muriel boat lift, uh, the invasion of uh, illegals from the South, et cetera, et cetera, were the, were the thesis. The Watts riots, et cetera, et cetera. Those were all the thesis. And here is the last antithesis to bring us into the synthesis, the results that they're looking for. It is titled, A Bill to Provide Swift and Certain Punishment for Criminals in Order to Deter Violent Crime and Rid America of Illegal Drug Use. It's 96 pages long, as I've stated, and it was introduced on February 22, 1990. In the Senate is Senate Bill 2245, and I think you've all heard things uh, on the news about them having had about 100 amendments to it now. It was introduced on March the 7th. Now, both of these are still in committee, and they're having problems in getting it out of committee. So you see, last week, there was a raid at 29 locations simultaneously by BATF, DA, DEA, FBI, Customs, etc., all a part of the national police, state police, city police, and so forth, 29 uh, different locations simultaneously to bring down some street gangs. Now, that's for motherhood and against sin, isn't it? That's beautiful. You and I are all for getting rid of the street gangs. But that's not what they did it for. They did it to get these two things, these two bills, off of dead center. That's what they did it for. Now, I ask a question. Were they able to do this five years ago without these bills? They did it last week without these bills. So why didn't they do it five years ago without the bills? So you can't tell me that they, they need the bills to do what they did with 29 different street gangs to de deter uh, America of crime, to get the crime off the streets. So there's another reason for it. This is the bill that legislates the, to declare war on drugs. And we'd be internally grateful if that's what it was going to be used for. If we could get drugs off the street of America, baking the, the brains of our kids, you and I would praise God. You and I would say, government, job well done. But that's not what they want it for. At the very outset of the bill, I'm going to get into it. 
The bill reveals the Hegelian nature of its intent. Section 3, Findings and Declarations of National Drug and Crime Emergency. We read this, paragraph 1. Next to preserving the national security, preserving the personal security of individual Americans, especially children, by enacting and enforcing laws against criminal behavior is the most important single function of government. Now this is a federal law that they're trying to pass now. Do you read that in the Constitution of the United States of America? The Constitution doesn't say that. They have mixed constitutional federal responsibilities with that of the state responsibilities with the simple use of the word government. And it's a federal law. And yet they can move states and cities and counties to do their will against this law with the National Police Force. Okay, continuing. Paragraph 2. The criminal justice system in America is failing to achieve this basic objective of protecting the innocent and punishing the guilty. Here is more Hegelian dialectics. Why is the criminal justice system failing? Who caused it to fail? You and I didn't cause it to fail. You and I didn't pass the laws that set it up for it to fail. They established the laws and the regulations over the past 30 years that would assure its failure. We have the Miranda ruling. What was that for? Just a part of it. The plea bargaining ruling. What was that for? Just a part of it. The jail standards rulings. That was just a part of it. All of these things they set up in order to assure the need for this bill right here. Paragraph 3. Reform is needed to ensure that criminals are held accountable for their actions, that they receive swift and certain punishment commensurate with their crimes, and that the protection of innocent citizens take priority over other objectives. All right now, that's more of the antithesis of a problem that they created. Why would we believe that the antithesis, this reform, this bill here, would do any more for us than all of the other bills that they gave us in the last 30 years when they were written by the same pool of congressional aides and legislative assistants? Same people, same bill writing, so why would there be any change? They continue with the statistics in the bill of the violent crime in the country. Now, you and I knew when they opened the borders to uh, any and all that would just walk across that we were in for a tremendous time of an increase in violent crimes. We knew this. We all talked about it. Continue with this, because they knew that was coming. Paragraph 11. The criminal justice system is overloaded and does not deliver swift and certain penalties for violating the law. In America today, there exists crime without punishment. Such conditions imperil the public safety, jeopardize the rule of law, and undermine the preservation and order in the community. Now, here's some more of their antithesis in the dialectics. All because they created the problems, they said the criminal justice system is overloaded. They wrote the jail standards. We have jails that are empty today. We have jails that are being used for something else today. We have jails that were torn down in order to build palaces for these guys. Some of them are palaces. And they, don't, they couldn't possibly hold all that they had intended to hold. That's a part of the dialectics. So <clears throat> they did all of these things like the Miranda rule, the jail standards ruling, the plea bargaining ruling, and all of this kind of thing. And then they decided two or three years ago to get tough. So they came out and they started arresting everything that walked on the street after dark at night, whether it was a Christian child or, or not. And so in getting tough, they had to get more laws. In getting tough, they had to have more uh, jails. In getting tough, they had to become more authoritarian. So let's read now the section on definitions. And now I think you'll begin to see what the bill is really for. For the purpose of this act, one, the term crime of violence against a person, that's in the bill, means a federal offense that is a felony and a as an element of use, 
attempted use or threatened use of physical force against the person or property of, or, or of another, or B, that by its nature involves a substantial risk that physical force against the person or property of another may be used in the course of committing that offense, and C, for which a maximum term of imprisonment of 10 years or more is prescribed by law. All right, now, just think about what they said here. It's got to be a federal crime. It's got to be one that has the risk of the physical force attached to it, and it's got to be one that has 10 years, as uh, at least 10 years as a maximum sentence for the crime, the federal crime. Now, what kind of laws are we talking about? Are we talking about murder? No, that's a state crime. Attempted murder? No. Manslaughter? No. Rape? No. Those are all state crimes, and they're tried in state courts. What are the laws we're talking about? We're talking about the genocide laws. We're talking about the sedition laws. We have spoken a lot about the sedition laws. Scriptures for America made sedition law USSA, talked about it. We're talking about the conspiracy laws. We're talking about hate laws. Those are the federal crimes that meet the requirements in their definition. Every one of those crimes show there's the possibility. They said even the suspected use of force. That's a catch-all. They can do it to anybody, anytime they say that you have a suspicion of using force they put the finger on you, and you're arrested. Sedition, conspiracy, hate laws, genocide. Those are the laws they're in, it's interested in. Now, the remainder of the 96-page bill describes what they intend to do with all those that they pick up. Section 102, temporary prison facilities and expanded capacity. A, in general, in order to remove violent criminals from the streets, those are these that have suspicion of using force, and protect the public safety, the Attorney General shall take action as may be necessary, subject to appropriate security considerations, to ensure that sufficient facilities exist to house individuals whom the courts have incarcerated. During the period of the National Drug and Crime Emergency, these facilities may include tent housing or other shelters placed on available military bases and at other suitable locations. The President may direct the National Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers to design and construct such temporary detention facilities. <clears throat> Here's a book that I have, a book that I have, Concentration Camp Plan for U.S. Citizen by William Pabst. He proved that there were already concentration camps in the United States, and he did so. He's a lawyer from Houston. He did so by writing letters to and from the United States government and in here are all of his letters to and from, and he pretty well proved that we already have concentration camps. Fact of the matter is, here's a, here's a map now showing 30 concentration camps at the time of this preparation. So they already have the concentration camp. What they're proposing in this bill, that they expand and make legal the concentration camps they already have, plus a tremendous expansion, and they're already making plans on how they do this. All right, now these camps will be legalized, that I showed here, and they'll be expanded. Then in paragraph 40, 14, we're getting into this now. Private construction and operation of federal, uh, federal prisons. A, in general, the Attorney General may contract with private persons to construct, own, and operate federal prison facilities. And two, construct or operate federal prison facilities owned by the United States, including the provision of substance uh, subsistence, care, and proper employment of United States prisoners. Four, in order to gain full cost advantages from economics of scale and specialized knowledge from private innovation, the Attorney General may contract with consortia, now you know what I mean by consortia, na multinational corporations, consortia or teams of private firms to design, construct, and manage as well as finance prison facilities. So they're even going to have national, multinational corporations finance the prison facilities and lease them, rent them to the United States government, and operate them 
all the way from uh, A to Z. That's their plan. Sub uh, subtitle section C, or section 131. Mandatory work requirement for all prisoners. A, in general, it is a policy of the federal government that convicted prisoners confined in federal prisons, jails, and other detention facilities shall work. The type of work in which they will be involved shall be dictated by appropriate consi security considerations and by the health of the prisoner involved. Such labor may include, but not be limited, to the local public works projects and infrastructure repair, construction of new prisons and other detention facilities, and C, prison industries and other appropriate labor. Then in this bill, they appeal or uh, repeal certain Sumner's Ashurst Act bill, uh, laws which state that uh, they um, uh, you can't use federal prisons for uh, prison labor uh, that would be manufacturing goods that would be in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, that would be available uh, to uh, to the public by private means, private contractors. Then they also go in to repeal portions of the Walsh Healy Act. Now that also states the same thing. So here now we have what is going to be the last building block to the United States becoming identical to the United Soviet Socialist Republic. It will be identical. We see the gulags of the Siberian labor camps all over again. We see the gulags in all of Russia. We see husbands and wives. We see parents and children. We see friends. We see business associates. We see church congregations that are fearful to talk to their friends about any problem in America because they will be afraid that they'll be put into the Siberian concentration camps of America. That's what we're faced with right now. This bill, if it passes, these two bills, if they pass, will do nothing for crime. They'll do nothing for drugs because you're not starting at the top of the drug machine. You have the Chinese Opium War going on in America today, just like you did in 1848, and it's run by the same group. They'll do nothing with that. That's for another purpose. Prison industries are already big business. You all know about Rudy Stanko. His family, three generations, were big in the meat cutting business up in Nebraska and Colorado. Three generations, Polish American. The mafia came in and took his meat business away from him. And of course in the process of taking his meat business away from him, he wrote a book. And this book is called The Score by Rudy Butch Stanko. For writing the book, he was thrown in prison. Well, he's a fighter type. He uh, maybe sometimes should be a little bit less belligerent, but God made him that way. But he saw when he was in prison that there was already prison industries. So he wrote another book, Slavery Survives in America by Rudy Butch Stanko. Well, for that, he's in the hole. All right, so we have this. He's a political prisoner. There's no question about it. In the United States, prisons are holding a multitude of political prisoners. They're everywhere. I have a little letter here I received uh, from a man in California who, uh, it, it's, it's a, a terrible story. Uh, that uh, uh, it, he was in California prison, and he's a political prisoner for what he had done. He uh, executed two blacks for raping and making a vegetable out of his girlfriend that he was about to marry. And he's in prison for doing that. A hundred years ago, he would have been applauded by the community. He would have been applauded by the preachers from the pulpits of America. 
but not now. He's a prisoner in America. In 1 Kings 19, we all know the story very, very well. Elijah went off into the wilderness after he killed the Baal priest. Jezebel was after him. And he says, I'm all alone. He went into the wilderness. He was fed. And God came to him and said, no, Elijah, you're not all alone. And he told him to go back. And he told him to go back and do the job that God had set out for him to do. I would recommend very highly that you read the full story about Elijah one more time. Living in these days. And God said, no, there are 7,000 that won't bow their knee to Baal. Now, 7,000 is not a literal number. But we have those 7,000 bow their knee to Baal. Right here is a part of them, a great part of them. And that's the reason I'm talking to you. You won't bow your knee to Baal. In the juncture in time in our country, back in the biblical stories of the Bible, there were many, many junctures in time where men were called forward to do a certain job. And they were so very important that they were given to us in these junctures in time as principles for us to follow. They're there for us to follow today. And that's the reason we read the Bible. That's the reason we hear the messages of the Bible. To give us the principles, the guidelines of how we're supposed to act. But the junctures in time in our country in which a type of the Elijah story happened was before the War for Independence. The stories of the Green Mountain men, Nathan Hale, Patrick Henry, Paul Revere, the Minutemen, the list goes on and on. In those days, men could slip off into the woods just across the road. And King George, the government, didn't know they were there. They were hidden. In those days, the life was so simple, but also the life was so private. In today's world, here in America, with this tremendous, sophisticated technology, we can't do that. You just can't slip off into the woods and be hidden from Big Brother. He's everywhere. But God never fails his word. The mood in America is changing. Good Christian people everywhere are becoming increasingly more incensed at the government's inability to govern wisely. They are now beginning to recognize that there is a need to counter a conspiracy that's taken place in Christian that's the reason for the day. They've got to counter that conspiracy that's taking place in the minds and the hearts of the Christian people of America. Everywhere, everywhere I go, they're, they're just stepping up. They're, they're increasing in numbers. And praise God, a lot of our young people are coming to this, no, to this uh, truth. Okay. All of these actions that have been taking place. Uh, we have uh, the uh, situation of the Army of God that are, they're still active, bombing abortion, abortion clinics in America. We still have the Phineas Priesthood, and it's growing. Uh, and and we, we know that that exists and is growing today. That sort of thing is taking place. We also have a concept that's called leaderless resistance. Colonel Amos and the Bay of, Bay of Pigs uh, fiasco developed this system of leaderless resistance where there was no organization. There was no cellular structure. There was no pyramidal structure. But one man and his God did the work. That is happening. It's increasing tremendously. I would like to close with us here today because we're at this juncture in time 
that the story of Elijah in the wilderness represents in America. We're at a very important juncture in time. 1990 is the start of a decade that America, they intend America to be taken from. I would like for you to remember some of the famous sayings that we all hold so dearly. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that, have no more that they can do. We have to have that feeling. We have to actually be willing to put our life on the line for what, for what is to be done in this decade. I am sorry that I have but one life to give to my country. Re remember that when Nathan Hale said that, country and nation, people, were one and the same. Today, country is a geographical boundary. We have nine nations in America today. He was speaking of your nation. As for me, give me liberty and give me death. Patrick Henry said that as a result of them imprisoning a minister for preaching without a license. And then there's one more that I'd like to repeat. It came from General George S. Patton, who was my commanding general in World War II. That was the war, if you'll remember, that was instigated by the identical same people that are creating the problem right here in America today. We went in on Utah Beach. We broke out at St. Lowe. I was there. I was at Utah. We broke out at St. Lowe. We crossed France so fast that they had to drop maps and fuel to us by parachute. We crossed the Rhine. I love George Patton. He knew we shouldn't have been there. But he said this, and I want to paraphrase it. It is well enough for a man to die for his country or cause, but it is much better for the enemy bastards to die for theirs. <laughs>